going to get started. Uh, we're talking about functional vision loss today. Um, so just kind of some introduction to this. Um, your first job when you have a patient come in and you kind of suspect this doesn't all add up, it seems like it might be functional, um, is to make sure that you exclude any organic causes of vision loss. So that should be kind of like um, primary thing that you're um, trying to figure out is could there be something organic going on? Is there something really subtle? Um, and then always keep in mind that um, patients that have organic disease may also have some superimposed non-organic behavior. And this is about like 15% of functional vision loss. So that can be really hard to tease apart. Um, so maybe even if their story doesn't completely make sense, there is something going on, but not all of it is organic. Um, and then pay attention to things like, you know, does the patient sign into the reception desk? Do they walk into the room and sit in the chair um, if they're supposed to be NLP? Um, if you outstretch your hand to shake their hand and don't, like, give them any verbal cues, do they shake your hand? Um, and so just be aware of their story and any secondary gain features. Um, malingering is willful feigning. Um, which is um, sometimes different than functional vision loss or like a conversion disorder. And then Munchausen syndrome is um, creating a real disease by self-infliction. So that's not really truly functional. Um, I think Dr. Shapur had an example of like a lady who was using like laser pointers and um, pointing them at her macula. Um, so that would be like an example of Munchausen syndrome. And then um, conversion disorder prevalence is 11 to 300 per, that well, should be 100,000. Um, and they occur in both uh, children and adults, but um, they're more common in women than men. And the mean age of children with functional vision or with conversion disorders is about 10 years old. Um, and then in about 65% uh, of people, both eyes are involved. Um, and then in the bilateral cases, um, both eyes are usually affected to the same degree. And in the unilateral cases, usually the vision loss in that one eye is worse than the vision loss in that it would be in a bilateral case. Um, and then decreased visual acuity and constricted visual fields are the most common symptoms or um, complaints with functional vision loss. Um, and a strong indicator of organic disease is if you see a central scotoma on visual field testing. So that's kind of like a red flag and rethink things if you see that. Um, what are some organic um, vision loss causes that may be really subtle early on and could be mistaken for functional vision loss? Can you think of anything? Yeah, good. What did you say? What about other like macular pathologies, maybe that are even common? Um, what's that? Yeah, or like think about like a young person. CSCR. And maybe stressed yeah, so CSCR can be like hard if you're just looking in. Sometimes it can be hard to see if you don't get an OCT or if you're not looking for it. White dot syndrome. Yeah, good. Um, BRAO. What's that? Yeah, BRAO. Um, yeah, if you're not looking for it. What's that? Stargard. Yeah, Stargard, especially early on, um, you might not be able to see a lot of changes. Um, so it's also important to like ask about family history and things like that. Um, so we'll go through these. Um, so idiopathic big blind spot syndrome or acute zonal occlude outer retinopathy, they're kind of on the same spectrum. Um, gives you a large blind spot. And then um, oftentimes on their MAC OCT, you can kind of see this like stippling of the ellipsoid zone um, where, it's, where it's disrupted, especially near the optic nerve. Um, bilateral retrochiasmal disease um, can, um, you know, you're not gonna see anything really on exam. Um, and so uh, be aware that, you know, to look for that, um, if there, especially if there's anything in their history that might suggest that to be the case. Um, and then chiasmal disease without optic atrophy like craniopharyngioma, uh, cone rod dystrophy like Srav said. Um, later on, their macula is gonna look abnormal, but especially if it's like early on and you're just not looking that closely, you're not looking for it, um, it might be hard to tell. Um, early keratoconus or any type of irregular astigmatism where they're not gonna you know, refract to 2020, um, but if you don't, oh my gosh, there's like a, 
bug crawling up here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're not going to refract, and um, especially um, like if maybe you can get them to pinhole better, but you can't get the refraction better. Think about getting a topography. Um, or if it's keratoconus that's progressed enough, then it could cause enough problems that they um, may not even have best corrected visual acuity to 2020. Um, and then early PSC cataracts. Um, and PSC cataracts are something that a lot of times people will just like notice all of a sudden. Um, especially, I feel like I've seen a lot of patients at the VA where it's like they have sudden onset vision loss and they just have this PSC cataract that's like probably crept into their visual axis. And, but a lot of times people, it's like one day they notice it. Um, and then levers, uh, maculopathy like CSCR or an ERM. Um, and then perineoplastic retinopathy, especially if the history fits retinitis pigmentosa, seen um, pigmento. Um, so you're, you would still um, expect to have some of the other findings like arterial narrowing um, and they're going to have, um, you know, outer retinal loss um, paraphobially, but that can be a lot harder to see if they don't have the um, classic bone spicules. So you can see this patient, they don't really have the classic bone spicules, but they still have the outer retinal loss on OCT. And then retrofulbar optic neuropathy, and then Stargardt disease, um, especially if they don't look like this uh, to start with. It can, it can be subtle to start with. Um, so if a patient is bilateral NLP, there's um, some tests that you can do. Um, this is probably the easiest one to um, figure out whether they really can see anything at all because you're just looking for oops, any type of vision. So there's the finger touching test where you ask the uh, patient to touch the fingertips of each hand together. And this is a proprioception test, not vision. Um, so if they act like they can't do it, a bilateral NLP patient should still be able to touch their fingers together. <laughs> Um, and then pupillary reaction, so normal pupillary reaction suggests that the anterior visual pathways are intact, but obviously doesn't rule out some types of organic disease that are retro, um, that are, you know, um, optic radiations and um, occipital lobe and, and so, so forth. Um, you can test OK Indrum, um, so you slowly rotate the OK Indrum in front of the patient and you look for eye movement. Um, and this similar to the mirror test where you slowly rotate the mirror from side to side in front of the patient and look for eye movement. Um, and then electrophysiologic testing, uh, flash and pattern reversal VEPs. Um, we think of this as more of like an objective test, but just um, bear in mind that you can still willfully suppress VEP by not paying attention to it or like kind of defocusing on the um, stimuli from the uh, screen and it can still give you false positive and false negatives. It's not a perfect test, but it's just kind of another thing that can add to whatever the overall picture is. You, so how does that work with EUAs and VEPs? They, they flash VEPs. Yeah, they Instead. put the contact lens on and it's like a, and that's why they cover the other eye because it's like a flash. Versus like this one. Or not, not the contact lens, the goggle. Right. This one is like the black and white, randomly Checkers. changing, mm -hmm. okay. pseudo random patterns. Yeah, if you like, if you focus your eyes, you could get a false negative result. Okay. But yeah, I guess that one is more objective because it's not awake. <laughs> but even still, with that one, I've seen it like not correlate to the last one, or just you know, sometimes there's a limit to how much you can tell you. Okay, the next section is monocular reduced vision. This kind of is a little bit harder to tease out. Someone is, there's two types of reduced vision, right? There's someone who says they can't see anything at all in one eye, and there's people who just say their vision's decreased in one eye. No vision in one eye is a little bit easier to tease out versus just decreased vision in one eye. Um, so the first thing to always look for when someone says they can't see out of one eye uh, is look for an, uh, an APD. Um, it's really, really, it, Substantially increases, but does not confirm the likelihood of non-organic vision loss. So it's just a lot less light. It's a lot more likely to be non-organic if uh, 
they don't have an RAPD. And just in case anyone doesn't remember how to check an APD, uh, a little flashlight test there. So another test you can do <clears throat> is the base out prism test. So you use a four to six diopter prism, place it in front of the bad eye with a base out. Um, so make sure you know which eye is you know the, the problem eye. Um, and then so the normal response is that normal eye will flick in and you'll get the psychotic correction um, or it's kind of this convergence. So you'll see, basically, you'll see the eye that's covered move. If there's any movement of that eye, they are seeing something out of that eye because there's, the brain wouldn't refixate through the prism if they weren't seeing anything. So it's just a quick way to put up there um, and see what happens with that eye. Then vertical prism dissociation. This one relies a little bit more on the patient, um, you know, telling you what they see. So you put the four prism base, uh, prism placed base down in front of the good eye this time. And so normal vision would see two readable lines um, and if it's if they're really not seeing out of one eye, then they'll only see the one line, and the other line will be blurred. Uh, so that one again requires the patient to cooperate a little more. So then there's these things we call confusion tests. So the key to confusion tests is patient they must be unaware which eye is being tested, and they also have to feel like it's part of the normal exam. If you tip them off that this is something kind of unique, and we're doing just to see if we're you really see like it they, it's these are easy to kind of fake um it's you know kind of say something even if it's wrong but just to kind of try to fake it depending or even if it's a subconscious faking i don't know if that's the right word but um to not acknowledge what they're actually seeing um so the first one i'm going to go over all these fogging tests the duochrome test the polarized lens test and the stereopsis testing so with fogging place a trial frame in front of the patient's face cover the bad eye with two cylindrical lenses. There's a lot of very different ways to do this. This is the one BCSC suggested. Um, so you put the, the um, let me show the picture here, make it make sort of sense. So you put the um, trial lens on and you get a minus six uh, sill lens and a plus six sill lens and you line up the axes. So they're basically canceling each other out. And I think it's probably useful to put another lens in the other eye since you are trying to sort of go with this, we're testing both eyes idea. And then as you have them start reading the, um, the lines, you slowly rotate one of the, the, the lenses so that you're inducing a lot of astigmatism. So it should get, you know, by the end of it, it's gonna be a 12 diopter spread, which is really hard to read through. So if they continue to read without any problems, um, then uh, you know, it indicates that they're seeing well. So you have that as you read them read through the good eye um, sorry, and you're fogging the good eye, I should clarify that, as you're doing this, um, so that you can see if they're still reading with the bad eye. To keep reading means he or she has some vision out of the bad eye. Next one's the duochrome test. Um, so you get the red-green glasses that we use for like the worth four dot test. And you put the red lens over the bad eye, and that's how we can remember, because red is bad. Mike, bro. Um, <laughs> and then you put on the red-green filter on the snow and chart. And uh, the green lens is over the good eye, so GG helps you remember which eye to keep it straight. Um, prevents the patient from reading the red letters because of the way the lights filter. Um, so if she can read, he or she can read the letters on the green side, the patient is seeing out of the bad eye um, because that's the red eye, red covered eye. So this is what they would see with both eyes. They truly have vision loss and they have um, the red filter over the bad eye. They would only see um, the um, the red side. Did I say that right? Um, so then polarized lens test. So before you put polarized lens on the patient, you got to check and make sure you know which one is um, blocking the light because the polarized lens test we use for uh, like in clinic, they have one is polarized vertically, one is polarized horizontally. So um, you just want to make sure you know which one is which because most screens will send the light polarized, including our Snell and charts upstairs on the computers. Um, so you can test this yourself sometime. You put it on and it will block, one eye will block the, the polarized light in the correct orientation. So place the polarized lens over the patient's face, block the bad eye, and you project the chart. So you gotta know ahead of time which one's which or else it's just gonna confuse you. Um, and then, so you project the light and then again, just have them read. If they can read um, the chart with both eyes open and you're blocking the good eye, then you know they can see. And stereopsis testing, this one's kind of obvious. If there's, you know, to have stereo vision, you have to use both eyes. Uh, so if they have any stereopsis, then 
they are seeing out of both eyes. Um, one thing though is that there's some tables and some ideas of the, how this correlates, like how much stereopsis they have that correlates to actual visual acuity. Um, it's okay. It's not really great though. You can't kind of hang your hat on and say, oh, they saw, you know, 300 arcs of stereo, so therefore they have 20x vision. Um, just keep that in mind. It's not really good to correlate those things. Um, and then I uh, just want to reemphasize the fact that if you need to, it's kind of some trickery and some magic and confidence and sort of, you know, okay, now we're going to do this and make it seem all normal. So they got to take you seriously. The last couple of uh, slides, I'll talk about binocular reduced vision. So, um, a couple of things. So, when somebody has binocular reduced vision, the question is, uh, what you know, what can you do to uh, bring out uh, a possible non-organic cause? Um, this is this is a test that, if you haven't rotated in neuroophthalmology yet for the residents, uh, you'll see this uh, done quite a lot. I've seen this done by you know Dr. Crum, Dr. Katz, Dr. Degree. I've done it myself. Um, I think it's a really uh, useful, easy test. So, you know, the, the scenario is a patient comes in, you know, ca I can't see in both eyes, you know, I can only see maybe the E on top line or, you know, or at least can see some letters. And so what you would do is start with a, show them the 2010 line and tell them, um, you know, can you see any of these letters, you know, and, you know, they say, no, no, I can't really see it. And you could ask them, can you uh, count how many uh, dots are there or how many letters are there? And say, no, no, I really can't, I really can't. I say, oh, all right. And then, and then you can, you know, continue encouraging, well, maybe the first letter is a little easier, you know, keep going and say, no, 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 I really can't. And then go to the 2015 line and, you know, do this again. And, uh, and you know, when, when, if they can't read it, say, oh, you know, uh, you know, this is like double the size already, you know, maybe the next line, you know, will we'll triple, quadruple the size, it'll be harder. And then you give them the 2020 line and they say, oh, you know, I think I can see now, I, I see five letters. All right, can you see the first letter? Oh, you know, still can't. Uh, you know, re really try, this is bigger. And then 2025 line, they can read. So um, yeah, I've seen that happen all, so it's a really good test. Um, um, and again, you know, reading better than the previous exam suggests um, a non-organic component. Um, so there, it's a really quite useful test. Uh, so that's the first test, bottom-up acu uh, acuity. Uh, it, this is something that we don't use in the neuro-ophthalmology uh, a lot. I've never seen this done, but this is in the BCSE. I just want to go through everything. Um, but uh, some, some people say, I can't read letters. Okay, we, we can use a tumbling e-chart, see if they can read those. Um, you can use chart with numbers. Uh, the other thing that you know, uh, just reminded me is, you know, some people say, you know, I can only read the top line. So give them a Snellen chart that has a top line with 2050, and all of a sudden they can read it. So, uh, so those are those are some you know maybe useful tricks. Um, there's also uh, 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 other things that you can do visual aids. Um, you know, you can give a trial frame that you just put basically multiple lenses, but equals what their correct prescription. And you know, you can you can give suggestions that these are special magnifying lenses and see if you can get them to see a little better. Uh, you know, potential acuity uh, meter can also uh, you can tell them that this can bypass uh, the visual block and see if they can have any improvement in vision. Okay, it's like kind of a, a you know pinhole test. So. So these are other tests that are not in the BCSC that I just wanted to let you know that there's other tests, and I've also learned a couple new things. First, near vision testing. Um, you know, we, there, uh, near vision testing and distance vision doesn't really correlate, okay? But if there's a large discrepancy of what somebody can see near and at distance, that may suggest a non-organic disease, okay? Um, second, stereopsis. You know, we show them the circles, we show them, uh, uh, you know the animals, but uh, and this is something new to me. But there is a you know a paper actually that uh, uh, correlates um, uh, you know the circles, how much one can see with circles, with uh, visual acuity. So for example, nine out of nine circles is approximated to 2020 vision. Uh, six out of seven um, or five out of nine circles, I can see there, uh, about 2070 uh, vision. So again, remember that stereopsis um, is a binocular function. This is not a monocular function. So some stereopsis may suggest that you're, uh, uh, one may be seeing a little better. So again, these are not, uh, these, are, these, these are tests. These are not um, 
Uh, this is not proof that they have a non-organic disease, but this can uh, have a, um, uh, suggest that somebody has non-organic disease. Second thing is a size consistency uh, test. Uh, you know, our Snell and charge, and at least in our um, uh, in our clinics, it's in the TV, uh, and they're at 20 feet, but. Um, if you move it to 10, you know, if you have a manual cell chart, if you move the patient closer to, to about 10 feet, the patient should be able to read the letters at least half the size of the letters that they can at full distance. So that's easy to do in um, most other clinics. Um, you know, Fort Street Clinic, we have that. So, so I think these are all um, good, easy tests as well. All right, now visual field defects. I have some cases for you guys, um, so uh, pay attention. So um, let's see, uh, it doesn't show one by one. I'll just kind of say this. So this is a 12-year-old girl. This is a real case. I got it from uh, this paper. But a 12-year-old girl that's, you know, all of a sudden uh, presented with a um, left temporal uh, visual field defect, um, you know, went to an uh, outside uh, optometrist, got a visual field, and um, showed, you know, the, you know, the, top, uh, the top figure right there. Um, and then went to an ophthalmologist and also did a visual field and also had this, this test. They got an MRI, it was normal, um, you know, and, and then uh, went to you know, this uh, neuro-ophthalmologist, all tests were normal. Um, uh, it, there was no APD, vision was 2020. They did, uh, uh, so in, in figure C, you see that left temporal uh, defect in, in the left eye, and then they did a manual, per, um, uh, like a Goldman uh, a visual field test, and also show that it matches up. Um, but the, the neuro-ophthalmologist, um, what they've done is they've repeated the Humphrey visual test um, with both eyes open and still saw the defect up above, okay? so. So, 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 and again, you know, the third line, persistence of hemianopsia during binocular f uh, visual field testing um, and, uh, and without an APD distinguishes this from an organic etiology to non-organic. So if you have both eyes open, one of the eyes, the right eye should be able to compensate for the temporal defect and still she was not, she was still having this dense defect. So uh, this is an example of how um, uh, a automated perimetry like Humphrey visual field testing that we have here can show, uh, can support a non-organic visual field defect. Um, also, non-organic visual field loss occurs in about one to five uh, percent of uh, pediatric patients in general ophthalmology. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not rare. Um, uh, other, other tests uh, that we can do uh, for non-organic are confrontation visual fields. So, you know, we, we all do this, uh, but when you're doing this, what you can do is map out where the, if it's a dense visual field defect that a patient um, uh, says, you know, you know, really map it out. Let's say it's in, in this area. Can you see this? No. Can you see this? No, no. So in your head, you've already kind of mapped this area out. And then, you know, do your tests, and then all of a sudden tell them, you know, I'm going to test your, you know, your motility. So your saccades, you know, can you look at my nose? Can you look at my thumb? All right. Look at my nose, look at my thumb. Great. Look at my nose, look at my thumb in the area of the visual field. If they have correct saccades, that suggests that they can see in that area. That's another way to say um, uh, that they, uh, that, uh, that it's non-organic. The second test is uh, the... Um, uh, kind of, again, counting fingers, telling them, um, you know, can you see, how, to tell you none if they don't see fingers. So, see fingers here, no, uh, or can you see fingers, yes, and two, two, and then you go here and they say none, okay? So, that suggests that they also see, seeing in that area. So, these are easy tests to do in the clinic. All right, my first case, uh, I'm sorry, it's not going one by one, um, but who has non-organic visual field loss, A or B? So in A, this is the tangent screen test. A, uh, the top uh, pictures are in one meter, and uh, the bottom picture is in two meters. Who has a uh, uh, non-organic, uh, likely non-organic visual loss, A or B? A, okay. So let me talk about the tangent screen um, for those of you who have not done this. So the tangent screen, you test at one, I'm sorry, not one millimeter, that's one meter. So one, <laughs> uh, one meter. Um, so in the top panel, patient sees one meter, and then you, you map out how you know their 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 basically their uh, visual field, and when they uh, when they go from one meter to two meter, that field should expand, um, and that you can see that in Figure B that you know the visual field expands. If it doesn't expand, or what it's called a tubular or gun barrel field, like it just stays like that, you know, 
people with non-organic visual field says, you know, if uh, they don't know that, you know, normally it expands, so they just see where they um, where they uh, saw before and just remain there. So if it's a tube or a gun barrel field, that's just a non-organic visual field. This is a test um, that we do quite often in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic, pretty easy to do as well. <clears throat> All right, case. Uh, what visual field suggests a non-organic visual field loss? Um, anybody? And you know this is you know for at least in this chapter the, you know this is uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk more about this because uh, this is actually in the old caps so anybody can guess this is sort of a trick yeah first one correct all of them okay so let's go all all of them you know why why, why all of them are non organic this is this is classic in a, for OCAP. So the first, the one on top left is, uh, you know, a spiraling isopters. Um, that one, you can see some spiraling, but also most important is crossing. And the third one is um, a, a study that I found is called a target visual field. So um, for the, you know, the ones that haven't rotated neuroophthalmology, let me just go over Goldman visual field testing. So, you know, there's several stimuli for Goldman visual field. So the size goes from zero to five, zero is the smallest, five is the largest. So this is a target size, okay? So it's a light. Intensity goes one to four, one is the dimmest, four is the brightest. Intensity is A to E, A is the dimmest, E is the brightest. So in this example, uh, the blue is one, four, okay? So it's a small size, uh, intensity four. And then in uh, the red one is, I think, uh, a five, a four. So it's a one, three. One, three. Okay. And, uh, but uh, the point is the red one has a larger size than the smaller one. So as uh, the stimuli is getting larger, you know, you should be able to have it, you know, ex, you know um, a, a larger uh, uh, area that you can see. Okay. So this is normal. Okay. So... Uh, and again, you know, just I just want to make sure that everybody understands this. But uh, when somebody's, uh, you know, uh, when somebody's like uh, uh, to draw this circle, it's not really a circle. Somebody points, you know, can you see this? This? No, 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 no. And then when they hit this, and they put an X, and when that's the place where somebody's seeing it. Uh, so that's a point in here. And then there's multiple points, and they just connect that dots to make that circle. Okay. So in the first case, we have spiraling. Um, so in spiraling, so concentrate on the red one first. So with the same stimuli, you know, as the test progresses, so, okay, so somebody can uh, see first maybe outside and top line. And then when you go to this, uh, when you go here, they say, oh, it, and now it's a little bit more constricted. And then when somebody's looking, and then the next, the third point is here, so it becomes progressively smaller and smaller. So that, that becomes why, why it spirals, okay? And then you do the next, the next you know, larger uh, stimuli, like the black one, and again, very similar. So uh, a spiraling um, isopter suggests a non-organic visual field loss. The second one is the crossing isopters. So as you've seen, as the stimulus, stimulus size gets larger, they shouldn't really cross each other. And in, in this case, you're seeing uh, you know, the green is crossing with the blue, and that suggests uh, a non-organic visual field loss. Uh, the last visual field test, um, and, and these, these two things, I've seen this in some questions for OCAPs, that's why I'm, uh, and sometimes when I first saw this, you know, you could memorize it, but, you know, I, I, I want you to understand it, really. And then the last thing is this uh, target visual field. Um, so as you can see, there are, you know, several colors, red, blue, and green. The protocol for this, so this was published in 2010, is that they started with a size 3, 4, E. So they go to a, so they, they map out the red first, okay? And then they go to a larger size, a 5, 4, E, which is the blue, which you can see already is uh, um, uh, crossing over. So that suggests non-organic visual field loss already. But they do a repeat 3, 4, E again. And then once they repeat the stimuli, the first stimuli, they even get it even smaller than the first one, which doesn't make sense. It should, it should be the same size as the red, but the, because the red, um, uh, I'm sorry, this should be green. The red and the green should be the same, but it's not. So that's why it's called a target visual field. 91% of like 50 patients that, I've, uh, that they've had a previous diagnosis of non-organic visual loss had a target pattern, while no eyes in the control group showed a target pattern. Um, and this is something that I've learned. Uh, we don't do this, but it's some, this can be done in 10 to 15 minutes, and this is something maybe we can uh, 
a try as well. So um, those are, that's it.